We generally speak of regression as a way to predict someone's score on a dependent variable. However, taken literally, prediction generally is not our purpose. Rather, our purpose is most often one of understanding the relationship between variables that go into that prediction. If we only have values for one variable, the best prediction we can make for any one individual would be the group's mean for the second variable. However, the more information I have, the better my prediction can be. For example, a prediction that is conditional on gender might allow me to better understand a prediction for males versus a prediction for females on a specific study. We can use a regression to explain how differences in one variable relate to differences in another, which allows us to predict a person's score on one variable from knowledge of that person's score on another variable. In this case, we will look at linear regression. But before we get started with analyzing data, we must make sure it is clean. Were any of the participants responding in unreasonable ways that would make us question the legitimacy of their responses? Were there any participants who had outlying data points on both variables? This might have a disproportionate influence on the resulting correlations. We should make a scatter plot of the data looking for undue influence of particular extreme data points. Then we can finally run our analyses, including and excluding extreme points to see what differences appear in the results. Let's look at a scatter plot. The degree of scatter points about or around the regression line remains about the same as you move from lower values of stress to high values. Due to the correlation of about 0.5, the scatter is fairly wide. The equation for a straight line is y equals bx plus a or something similar. When we predict something, we add a hat to the y that looks like a caret to indicate that we are predicting. The symbol is then called y hat. B stands for the slope of the regression line, which is the amount of difference in y associated with one unit difference in x. A is the intercept or the predicted value of y when x equals 0. We want the values of y hat for different values of x. And we'll come close as possible to the actual obtained values of y. Remember that the reason we use y hat is to indicate that the values we are searching for are predicted values. We are looking for the best fitting line. We want to minimize any errors of prediction. We want our predictions to be accurate. The difference between our prediction and the actual value is called error or residual. You can think of residue. To find the best fitting line, we want to find the equation for a line that minimizes errors or the size of all residuals. Remember that errors on either side of the best fitting line will offset each other because the line goes right through the middle. So as before, we will not sum up the errors. Instead, we will sum up the squared errors. Thus, we are minimizing the squares of the residual, giving us what is called a least squares regression. A least squares regression. Here we see the formulaic equation for calculating both B and A. You may notice that A is calculated after B. After we've determined what A and B are, we can present an equation where A and B are filled in for the data that we are using. This is called the regression equation. A and B are called regression coefficients. Now we can predict y based on the potential values of x. As we are cre creating the regression equation, we are also using the correlation, which is the covariance of x and y divided by the standard deviations of the two variables. 
If the correlation is not significant, then the slope of the regression line will also be non-significant, meaning that there is no significant change in predicted narcissism as a function of the year in which it was measured. It is the slope of the regression line that is tested for significance. We are testing to see if there is a predicted significant change. The idea of regression to the mean is important. If the meaning is correct, then any deviation from the mean is likely to be offset over time. Think of the mean as if it's your true amount of knowledge on a test. Say you made an 85. Or say that your true amount of knowledge on a test is an 85, but you made a 40 or a 70 or a 99. Regression to the mean suggests that although on one test you might do really well, perhaps by guessing, but eventually your true amount of knowledge will become evident. You might have a second test where you do more poorly than you actually should. You make some mistakes on questions that you actually knew the answer to. Things even out such that all scores regress to the true mean. When we talk about the accuracy of prediction, the important point is not whether we can draw a straight line through the data. Rather, we are most concerned as to whether the line represents a reasonable fit to the data. The standard error of the estimate indicates that it is the standard deviation of y predicted by x. It is also referred to as residual or error variance. The error associated with our prediction is a function of the deviations of y about the predicted point. In this case, the predicted point is y hat rather than the mean of y. Let's return to the concept of effect size. R squared is a measure of predictable variability. It is called the effect size. On R squared, an R squared of 0.24 means that we can explain 24% of the variability in the dependent variable by using the independent variable. It's important that we find good predictor variables. If you are an administrator in college, you would want to know what are the predictors of student dropouts so that you can minimize those. With research, we can test predictor variables to determine what amount of variability they can explain in the de dependent variable. We can even create models that include multiple predictor variables that have additive explanatory and predictive ability. It's rarely one thing that causes something else to occur. Rather, several variables interact and change, influencing change in a dependent variable. If we want to influence change in depression to minimize it, and we have an intervention to do it, we might study the variables used in our intervention. An example could be number of hours spent in therapy. We could add the variable of the appropriateness of the psychopharmaceutical or treatment by medication. Essentially, by collecting data on what we are doing, we can find evidence that supports whether our methods are working consistently. We could also discover that they are failing, which would influence us to change our methods. If we have methods that consistently predict a decrease in depression, we have the ability to help people. This is one way that research is extremely useful. Without collecting data from many observations, we can't have confidence that what we are doing could work with new patients or the general population. Let's look once more at the influence of extreme values. Notice these two scatter plots. In the second one, the outlier, Northern Ireland, has been removed. Notice the drastic change in the slope of the regression line. Isn't the revised regression line going to be a better predictor of what is most likely to occur? Sure, outliers will continue to happen now and then. But when we predict, we want to talk about the most likely future scenarios for the widest set of the population. As I said earlier, when using regressions, we test the slope of the regression line for significance. When we only have one predictor, the test for the slope is numerically equal to the test for the correlation coefficient. Here we see some output. First, we see some correlations that are 1.0. 
but they don't matter because that's the correlation of a variable with itself. The correlation of stress with symptoms is 0 0.506, which is a moderate relationship. We might also notice the n value of 107. That means that there were 107 participants for observations. In the model summary, we see the correlation again, but we also see the r squared value, which tells us the percentage of variability in the dependent variable explained by the independent variable. In the ANOVA figure, we might glance at the sum of squares and the degrees of freedom and the mean squares before we focus on the F statistic and whether or not it is significant. We see the p-value associated with the F statistic. Finally, of less importance, we see the T statistic associated with the stress coefficients and its associated p-value. At what level are the F statistic and the T statistic significant? Furthermore, in plain words, what should or does that mean to us? As we've seen before, we need to concisely but comprehensively explain our findings. The write-up of a regression analysis is similar to what we've done before. We would leave out the intercept because it has no substantial meaning. Finally, let's reflect on the difference between regression and correlation. Correlation is the degree of relationship between two variables and does not require identification of an independent variable or a dependent variable. In a regression, a regression coefficient is the magnitude of a change we expect. This allows prediction. with a healthy concern for error. Thank you. And please repeat any slides or lectures that you have trouble with or that you think you need to repeat. Um, remember that the quizzes are additive and they build upon each other. So as you proceed, if you do poorly on one quiz, don't think that, well, you'll never need that information again. It's good to go back and learn it so that you can build off of the foundation. Thank you very much for your attention during these lectures. I hope you found them useful. Remember to use the study guides to to guide you as you prepare uh, for the quizzes and to focus in on the most important aspects of statistics and research methods at this level. Thank you.